Last week we discussed uh, Psalm 29. Does anybody remember what we talked about for Psalm 29? Brother Larry. That's right. Brother Jarrett. Yeah, Psalms 29 uses, does a lot of comparison to the power of the Lord to the, the, the power of a, of a storm. Verse 3 talks about thunder. Um, in verse five, talks about a you know like a great wind that would break the cedars and uh, and and basically basically it's a it it starts with a storm that's out on the Mediterranean and watches and the throughout the passage kind of watches it blow over uh, Lebanon and down into uh, and down into Israel and and the the psalmist looks upon the majesty and strength of this storm and then compares it to the power of our Lord. Um, Anybody else? Pretty good, pretty good. Chapter 30 is uh, is an interesting is an interesting chapter in that it is it talks significantly about the high points and the low points of our Christian walk and what led David to some of his high points and his low points. The superscription of the chapter is that a is a psalm and song at the dedication of the house of David. This would be David's own home. Remember, David was not able to build uh, the temple uh, or anything like that. So, uh, Solomon, I believe, built the his own house, and then of course we know that he built the uh, built the temple. But this was at the dedication of that house, and I believe in this. You know, David had had a lot of uh, vagrancy in his life. Uh, he was uh, he was a shepherd boy, which means he spent a lot of time just moving around different pasture, and then. Uh, he was a servant to Saul, and then after he was a servant to Saul, he was on the run from Saul and spent a long time on the run from Saul. Then he lived with the Philistines for a little while, and then he went back to Israel and became king of Israel and was king for a little while, and then Absalom showed up, and then he was on the run from Absalom. David didn't really have a lot of time set in one place, and so I believe at this dedication, you have David kind of looking back at some some very high points and some very low points, and looking back at some what are the, some of those things that led him to those places. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lift, lifted me up, and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought my uh, up my soul from the grave; thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. So he opens with um, uh, with extolling or praising the Lord uh, for all the things that he had blessed him with. This is a common refrain throughout the Psalms, and as it should be. The Psalms are about praise to the Lord. That's their, that's their central focus. Uh, finding this is not should not be unusual to us or, or extraneous. Uh, you know, if you read through the Psalms, it, you go through a lot of these, and uh, praise the Lord, uh, extol the Lord, uh, you, let all God's people praise the Lord, give thanksgiving, you know, and, and you can very quickly in your study of Psalms start skimming past a lot of that because like, well, this is the same thing we were talking about before, but in every, in every instance, the Lord is deserved of the praise that is being that is being given to Him. There, it is. It is not extraneous to have a hundred and fifty chapters in which some praise or glory is given to God. It, it in and in the very same way, we're you know uh, when we when we when we study when we spend our time in, in in song. We talked about song worship in our last lesson, and we and we and, and we do these things that, that it, it's it's not it's, it shouldn't be a burden for us to thank the Lord for the things that He's done done for us. Um, verse two, He says, "I cried unto Thee, and Thou hast healed me." Heal, the healing power of God 
Another reason, uh, another reason to pray, he said, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought my soul up from the grave. David uh, was near death. I don't believe he was dead, uh, but was near death, and uh, the Lord had healed him. You know, it, 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 I, it's not unusual that I don't think, or, or accidental that I, you know, at least in my own family and my my in laws' family, that we're in a a a state right now of unrest with uh, one of our own having uh, um, uh, medical issues right now, and 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 how close, you know, I I I watched I. I as the news came in about everything that was wrong with uh, my father-in-law, I, I, I watched and, I, and the things that were wrong with him within a matter of days, I don't think Dennis would have been with us any longer. Um, and a lot of people, when they pray for healing, they pray for the doctor's hands, and, and, and that's all good, too. I'm not, not necessarily say, saying that, that we have to have physicians, but... Um, healing is not just about, well, the doctor did this and now he's feeling better. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, think about the timing. Think about the confluence of events that lead to coming from near destruction to, to perfect healing. To ba ba and, and all of the little things that could have gone wrong that God orchestrated like a like a uh, like a, a a a conductor before an orchestra, just 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 guiding each and every path to make sure that things are that things work out to His will. Uh, sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. For His anger endureth but a moment; in His favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Verse four says to. Verse 4 says to sing unto the Lord and then to give Him thanks. But why? It says, at the remembrance of His holiness. Now, that's a double-edged sword. And I think verse six or verse 5 kind of eridi kind of explains that in that... The holiness of our God cuts both ways. If you're in His favor <laughs> uh, and you're walking His path, things are gangbusters. They're, 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 they're really good. Everything, every, everything is going your way. But if you're out of His will and you're working against Him, that very same righteous standard that He is the epitome of and the personification of is a detriment to you. And I, and I believe that's why he goes that for his anger endureth but a moment. How many of us have crossed the law of God, even in the smallest way, a little white lie, and found ourselves at the, the mercy of the anger of our God because his standards does not change. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, Jesus is love and all this stuff. And I think what they're trying to do is water down the fact that sin still has an impact. That, 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 that whenever, whenever we do wrong things, well, Jesus loves us anyway. Oh, and I'm sure he does. You know, he, he went to a cross and died for your sins. He loves you despite the horrible, wretched thing that you are. But that does not excuse you from your actions. The law of the Old Testament just doesn't go away because, because Jesus loves you. Now, the ultimate punishment of the law, that, that is, is done away with, but you are still responsible. And so when we measure up our horrible actions against God's holiness, that's when, that's when the anger comes out. That, 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 that's when the, the, the weeping, it says, weeping may endure for the night. That, the, that, that our actions have consequences is without question. But... In his favor is life, and then the later half of the verse, but joy cometh in the morning. You know, I think it's important, and I think the weeping is there also for a reason of we find out that we've done something against the Lord. We, we, have, we have actively worked against him. But where's the repentance? 
Where's the sorrowfulness? Uh, you don't see anybody getting upset about the things that they've done anymore. No, nobody is sorry about their actions. Nobody explains their sorrowfulness. Nobody, no, 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 nobody uh, uh, op- openly says that, 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 that they're in trouble. No, no, I'll even venture to say this, and I can't look in each and every one of your own lives and your own prayers, but I would even venture to say even our private, we don't admit that we've done wrong. Because we, we hold ourselves at such a high esteem. Well, I'm a Baptist. And we say it with such with, with such an air of haughtiness, and right. look at me, and 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 be, 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 because I can flip to a half dozen pa- places in this Bible and tell you where I'm right, that we're just going to put all those other things that we've done to the side. There's no weeping. There's no upset. And you know what? I'll tell you this right here. God's not within a thousand miles of it. Uh, you can know this book from backwards to front, and I and 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 you can you can you, you can you can preach until you're blue in the face, and you can teach until and, and, and until you're falling down tired, and and you can and you can do all the things that you want to do, but God is not within a thousand miles of your of your haughtiness, of your open sin, and and, and your in- unwillingness to repent. He's not going to associate with it. Why should he? That goes right back to the to, 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 to verse four, his holiness. Because he is holy and you are not, he you cannot hold on to God and mammon. You've got to let go of one. And in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I believe that 6 and 7 is an example of what 4 and 5 are alluding to. It says, In my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Both of these sound these sound great. So things were going good. And in that time of going good, it says, I'm not going to be moved. And then he goes on, Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Everything is all David. Everything just keeps coming up great for him. And then there's like a turn that if you're not really paying attention that you, you might miss. But it says, Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. Everything's going good, good, good. God's not with him anymore. I think the, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, I think the reasoning can be found in verse 6. And in my prosperity, I said, I... <laughs> shall never be moved. You you notice the specific pronouns (laughs) that are being used there. I, 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 me, me, me. I think in retrospect, he looks at, in verse 7, he says, Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain strong. But David did not attribute the prosperity of the moment to who it actually belonged to. I, 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 me, me. We're, 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 we're haughty creatures. I, I have a, personally, I have a, a, a problem when, when people compliment me. I have a trouble accepting compliments because I, 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 when, when somebody says, oh, you did a good job with this, a lot of time that I'll, I'll make a self-deprecating joke or something, but that's just my personality. But even even the fact that I don't like to take compliments very well, there's always a little gremlin inside of me that says, see, there you go again, you are the best at what you do. (laughs) And that little gremlin is easy to feed. David, everything was coming, going so good for him. <laughs> everything was just, it was just all aces. He, he, you know, he, he, he blind throws a dart at the wall and it hits the middle. You know, it was just, everything's good. And then God's all of a sudden not with him at all. It says he hid his face from me. And our, our pride, and I, I, I think I think Baptist pride is a is a big issue. I think I think I think regular just old man flesh pride is a bad thing. Uh, you know we we 
joking earlier about the, uh, the, the, the biblical term Abraham. Sarah called Abraham Lord. And, and yeah, yeah. And the way that that was used and that was was much more respectful and a in a better relationship showed within that in the scripture than the way that we would like to take it, especially as as men. We, we would like to lord lord over the people in our households, but that's not what that... You know, I, I think I explained not many, many months ago uh, with Brother Ken as an example uh, what a good Lord is about. A good Lord is not selfish. A good Lord is not, is, is, is not, a, is not a dictator. There are differences. But we want to be that of our own lives. We want to be... I'm the king of my castle. I'm the charter of my own destiny. And you know what? Some of that is what we refer to as American pride. See, some of the principles that this entire nation was founded on are lies and not great. And God does not respect any of that. The Bible is very clear that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Well, I'm the, I'm the best teacher that ever was. Doubtful. I know more about the scriptures than anybody else around me. Are you sure? I know I'm the best order that, is, that, that, that has graced the pulpits of the 21st century. Probably not. But we tell ourselves these things, and, and even, if, even if we feign humility, there's always that little thing in the back of our mind. And, and if we feed that, if we let that have its place, and, and, and we, start, we start acting as if, well, I must be the ultimate authority on X, Y, or Z. You, you've done lost. The Bible is very, very specific about making the simple, the wise ones, con- confounding people that hold themselves up at a at a higher place than everybody else. Because at the end of the day, you. You and you and you and you and you and everybody else in here are nothing without the Lord. You don't know nothing. You have nothing. Brother Larry preached this morning about revealed truth. Anything that any of us, and and I I have been studying the Bible since I was saved at nine years old. Sincerely, I've been to Sunday school and stuff, but that's Sunday school. But sincerely trying to look at the Word of God in an objective and spiritual manner since I was nine years old, and I can tell you right now, I I, I know as much and as little as I as I did then. There is I know so much more and so much less than I ever have, and all of it is because of the Lord, and the Lord reveals it to us. You don't know anything about the Scriptures separate and apart. The Lord saying, "Hey, I'm just going to go ahead and flip you over to this passage, and I'm going to show you exactly what I meant to say here." And gaining that is a gift. It's as much as a gift as your salvation. It's as much as a gift as the air that you're sucking in your nose right now. And the same thing goes for our earthly possessions, for our jobs, for our houses, for our lands, for our automobiles, for everything. You know, I, I drove that old Dodge pickup. I think this red one's about to get there too. But I, 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 I drove that old Dodge pickup for... I think I put 20,000 miles on it, or 30,000 miles, and it was bro- almost dying then. And every time I turn the key, you just say, Lord, let's, let's ride it over one last time. And it, just like the widow's barrel, it scraped its way onto Dover, and then it scraped its way back to the house. And not, not because I was a mechanical genius, and I'm not. <laughs> not, because I, not, not because I knew just, you know, just how to treat her to get her to go a few more miles. No, I'm pretty sure the Lord drove it like a Hot Wheels car all the way to Dover and all the way back home because it was not doing a lot on its own. Everything from the highest person, from the wealthiest person to the lowliest among us, all that we have is owed to the Lord. And I believe David saw that here. I cried unto thee, O Lord, unto the Lord. Oh, I skipped a verse. No, I didn't. Uh, I cried unto thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? 
Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. There it is. David realizes that if, if I shall not be moved, it will because, be because I am a tree that is rooted deep in a rock. He says, I, I, I cried, I made supplication. He even made a deal, kind of. He says, if, if, if you let me go down, who's going to praise you, Lord? Well, I mean, the Bible says, if, if all cease to praise him, the rocks will start crying his name. Um, good try, David. Not really a good, good deal you're making there, but you, you, best, best case scenario you can come up with. But he says, he asks for mercy, and then what do you have? Be my helper. He, David remembered in this moment, oh yeah, I'm just a scalpel in a surgeon's hand, capable of nothing but laying on an operator's tray, save a surgeon reach over and do a wonderful work with me. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end... Because of, for the purpose of, that my glory may sing praise to thee and be not silent. Why does the Lord give us the talents and the abilities that we have? Sister Abigail played the piano this morning. Sister Donna played it earlier this morning. Uh, 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 Brother Larry preached. Brother Junior taught. Brother Kenny's going to be preaching in, in a few hours. Where do these talents come from? Where do the abilities to do these things? And all of us have them. Well, they're, they're, we're, we're, we're tools for the master use. And why? Why do we have them? To the end. For the purpose of. The, all of the reason that any of us do anything, that any of us exist in the first place, that my glory, that everything, when you receive a compliment, that my glory can sing praise to you. Why, when you receive a compliment on your preaching and stuff, do I think it's personally uh, uh, productive for you to say to ask them to praise the Lord for it? Why, why, why do I say that? Because any credit that you're trying to give me has... There's nothing here that was able to do that. Right. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to thee forever. Eternal praise. Now, here in this flesh, we're able to keep up the praise for, I don't know if you can sing a while, you can maybe keep it up for a couple hours. We all need to sleep and eat and rest and drink. But this is a promise, I think, as often as I can, I'm going to praise. But ultimately, David will be able to keep this promise because that's going to be our role in heaven. We're going to go from using our lives and our actions and sometimes our mouths and our minds and our hearts to praise the Lord, sometimes to being that being our only goal, our only job. to put the angels to shame, all the praising and, and trumpeting they've been doing for thousands of years to show them, well, let's see what a saved soul can do here. To do it forever. Any questions, comments, concerns, critiques on Psalm 30? Amen. Glory to God. Praise the Lord for it. You are dismissed. Have a phenomenal week.